Hi there, my name is Aaron Lancherman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And this is my quarantine hair. And I would like to welcome you to the second lecture in the summer 2020 offering of GPU programming for video games. So the model for creating computer graphics we're going to be looking at this class is generally called the rasterization model. This is in contrast to something like ray tracing. So life for our objects begins by a pile of triangles defined probably by some 3D artist using a piece of software such as 3D Studio Max, Maya, or Blender. And for every frame, these triangles are subject to various three-dimensional transformations to place them wherever they need to be in space and to be projected onto the two-dimensional surface of the screen. These triangles are then converted into a series of pixels in the rasterization process. And this is the stage where the final color of the various pixels is computed. We'll be writing two kinds of shader code in this class, namely vertex shaders that process these three-dimensional vertices, and pixel shaders, aka fragment shaders, that decide on the final color of the pixels. So something about the vertex shaders is that they process each vertex individually and they don't create new vertices. There are other kinds of shaders called geometry shaders that can create new vertices, and there's also compute shaders that are much more general kinds of things that might be thought of as more general purpose GPU programming, but we won't be looking at those in this class. We'll be focusing on vertex shaders and pixel shaders. If there's two dimensional coordinates, this tends not to be highly controversial. Usually you have X going left and right, and you have Y going up and down. However, when you're entering the realm of three dimensional graphics, things start to get very confusing because nobody settled on a set of consistent notations. So most mathematics textbooks will take the x and y plane and put that on the table and then use z to go up and down, and they'll use a right-handed coordinate system, meaning that if you raise your right hand and you put out your thumb that goes along the x-axis, put out your index finger that goes along the y-axis, and you're driving on Highway 400 in Atlanta, finger goes up the z-axis. Now, if we enter the realm of computer graphics, quite often people might still use a right-handed system, but they use Y going up. So here our thumb is going to the right, the index finger is going upward, and our driving on Highway 85 in Atlanta finger is going towards you. The OpenGL API uses this, as well as the XNA framework developed by Microsoft to allow people to program on the Xbox 360. There are also tools that use a left-handed coordinate system, such as Microsoft's Direct3D, as well as the Unity software that we'll be using in this class. And here, if you pull up your left hand, your thumb points along the x-axis, your index finger points along the y-axis, and your driving on Highway 75 in Atlanta finger goes along the z-axis, but in this case, it goes away from you. I always thought this was a very odd set of decisions because Microsoft created Direct3D that is fundamentally left-handed, and then they created XNA that's built on top of it, but then they switched to a right-handed system, which always seems strange to me. And Unity was originally a Mac-only product, and so that certainly wasn't using Direct3D, and so that must have been using OpenGL. Now, internally, Unity 3D will use Direct3D or OpenGL or Vulkan or whatever's around, and it will make various transformations to make it look consistent from the point of view of the user. So the main distinction here is whether positive Z values go towards the viewer and negative Z value goes away, or whether positive Z values go away from the viewer and negative Z values go towards the viewer. It's not a completely out of the blue decision to use Y going up instead of Z going up as in most, most mathematics books because this matches the way screen coordinates are usually defined. Although I should note that in these kinds of systems, positive going Y goes up, but in traditional 2D game programming, Y values go downward. There are some tools out there that use a Z going up approach, which is closer to your typical mathematics books. The Unreal Engine, at least the last time I looked at it, used a Z up approach with a left-handed coordinate system, whereas the id Tech Engine Quake used a right-handed Z up system. I mentioned Radiant here. This is the editor that is used with the Quake Engine. The Source Engine uses the same kind of coordinate system, which makes sense because it originally had a Quake base, 
And the editor for that, which my son has used a lot to create various mods, is known as Hammer. This kind of system is also used by the C4 engine, which was developed by Eric Lingle. Eric wrote an excellent book called Mathematics of 3D Computer Graphics. The latest version of the C4 engine is actually known as the Tombstone engine. It's a lesser known engine, but it has an interesting clean architecture that I would recommend checking out. But one thing to keep in mind is even though these kinds of tools typically use Z for a vertical axis when it concerns 3D coordinates, when they do that final projection onto the 2D screen, they go ahead and use Y for the vertical coordinates. So if you take the left-handed system here and rotate it 90 degrees, you could redraw it like thus, and this is probably what you would see when you pull up the Unreal Editor. So in this case, we're now thinking about Y is going right instead of X in the other way that we've typically written things, and now this X is going away from you. The underlying 3D art in games is usually made in some sort of modeling software, and just as in the case of game engines, there's no consistency here either. What's interesting is Maya and 3D Studio Max are both Autodesk products. One of them uses a Y-up system, the other uses a Z-up system. Both are still right-handed. Blender is an open source product that's improved dramatically since I first ran this class in 2007. It uses a right-handed system. Milkshape was a relatively inexpensive 3D modeling software solution that was fairly popular among people doing things like making mods for Half-Life. At least at present, the models used in 3D games are formed from triangles, and each of the points on those triangles has an X and Y, Z coordinate defining those three vertices. Typically, each of those vertices also has an associated unit normal, and this arises from the export process that your 3D artist will make from their 3D modeling software. So typically, the artist will create some sort of high-resolution, smooth parameterization of a surface, and they will run an export procedure that splits this into different facets of varying degrees of resolution, and you might have these for different purposes. So you might have a very high-resolution model with a lot of vertices that might be used to generate pre-rendered cutscenes, and then you have a lower-resolution model that's used for actual gameplay. And when this is split into different triangles with different vertices, some normal vector information will be computed that tries to get a sense of what the underlying curvature of the surface represented by these various triangle is. This is extremely important in computing realistic looking lighting. Without this information, you can get this quote unquote flat shaded look where you can readily see the polygons making up the object. But if you use this normal information when doing lighting calculations, the result looks much smoother. Some 3D models may also have color information associated with the different vertices, and you can interpolate between these colors when rendering the object. But nowadays, vertex colors are not actually used very much, because usually that color information, as we'll see later, is embedded in some sort of two-dimensional texture that provide a lookup into that 2D texture. Sometimes you will see this color slot being used, but it may be used for some other kind of information used in the rendering process and not typical color information. So typically what you'll have is a list of vertices. So you'll have the XYZ for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then you'll have a list of triangles that are indices into that list of vertices. So this saves you a lot on memory usage. Now, the order that you list these in can be important. A common technique to try to avoid doing unnecessary computations is an idea called culling, where we essentially only want to render the triangles that are faced towards the viewer and not bother to render the triangles that are facing away from the viewer. One approach to this is to use the normal for the facet. Now, these normals that we're using for culling, these are different than the vertex normals that I talked about earlier that were used for lighting. For those, the different vertices will have different normals. In the case of a particular triangle, there's just one normal for that triangle. And the way we embed that kind of information is by choosing some sort of order to list the vertices in, either a left-handed system, which in this case we would go from V1 
V3 to V2. And what we're doing is we're imagining that the normal is your thumb and then your fingers are curling around the vertex order. So we have V1, V3, V2. Uh, let's check. V1, V5, V3. So we've got V1, V5, V3. Oh, I need to make those arrows appear again. So for this one, if we point our thumb upward with our left hand, our fingers will curl V1, V6, V5. So that's down here. For up here, okay, if we point our fingers up again, we've got V7, V6, V1. Ah, down here it's listed as V1, V7, V6 in that order. Let's see, what else do we have? Okay, now take your left hand, point your thumb to the right, and we've got V5, V6, V3. That's here. And last but not least, we've got V4, V3, V6, curling our fingers around again with our thumb of the left hand pointing to the right. That's V4, V3, V6. You could also have a right-handed system for this. Now, the question of are you using a left-handed or right-handed curling convention for these normal vectors, that could be completely independent about whether your actual 3D coordinate system in your engine is left-handed or right-handed. So using the system, let's take a look at the triangles that we wouldn't draw, the triangles facing away from us. So in this particular case, we have V1, V2, V7 curling with our thumb pointing to the left. We'll have a V2, V8, V7, again, curling our fingers with our thumb pointing to the left. Let's see, so we had this one, V2, V8, V7 in that order. If we're pointing our thumb backwards, we'll have V7, V8, V4. Uh, here it's written as V4, V7, V8. This one here, again, with our thumb pointing backwards, curling around, we have V4, V6, V7. And for the other two, we need to point our thumb downwards. So pointing our thumb downwards, we have V2, V4, V8, the order our fingers are curling. V3 going down here, we have V2, V3, V4. So we've got those covered. There are, are a lot of calculations that are done in computer graphics that can be done in different orders. Now, the exact computations you do at each stage of the graphics pipeline might be different depending on how you choose to order this, and particularly where we, for instance, decide to do lighting. But there are a lot of cases where you can rearrange these in different ways. How you want to rearrange these will often depend on the particular hardware you are computing it on. Back in the day when GPUs didn't do very much and you had to do most of your calculations on the CPU, the ways you would want to arrange this computation were very different than a modern situation where you wind up sending a lot of raw stuff to the GPU and, and expecting the card to sort it out later. So here we've talked about just general representation of 3D objects using different 3D coordinate systems. There are actually several coordinate systems that are used in doing 3D graphics. The model coordinate system is what your artist works with. That's the coordinate system they're working with in Blender or Maya or some other piece of 3D modeling software. We need to transform those coordinates into the world coordinate space. And that's basically the view space of the level editor. That's what you're looking at when you're placing, say, the same object, say, the same tank model for enemy tanks or something at different places in the level that you're making. The world transformation's job is to take you from that artist space to the level designer space. The view transformation takes us from that world coordinate space that the level designer is working with to the actual space used by the camera. So this will be from the viewpoint of the player in something like a first person game, or it might be pulled back a bit for a third person action game, or pulled back even more for something like an old school RPG or some sort of real time strategy game. The projection transformation is part of the final procedure of going from the view of the camera to actually taking things and projecting them onto the two-dimensional surface of the screen. We're going to use the language of a matrix algebra to describe these because it's a convenient way to combine various transformations, but you do not need to have had a full class on linear algebra or remember much of linear algebra at all to do well at this class, as we'll be using a fairly small subset of linear algebra, and this class isn't really focused on the theory aspects of 3D graphics. It will be more focused on the practical implementation issues. 
So if you haven't had linear algebra, you'll still more or less be okay. And these transformations are going to form the basis of the next couple of lectures.